From the Dice Abide Live studios, it's Late Night War Games with your hosts, Adam and John. Hey. Uh, thank you, Jane. Hello, everyone. I'm Adam, but you know me as the Dice Abide. For now. That sounds very ominous. For now. <laughs> Well, John, how you doing? What are you drinking? Oh, you cannot be heard. Nope. But I'll talk about what I'm drinking while John figures out his audio. Um, I am having a, a Modelo. <laughs> it's, it's nothing special, but it is now the most popular beer in America. Okay, that should, I, that should work now. You should be able to hear me now. Thanks for Excellent. the catch we'll Um but yeah, yeah this so is Modelo. I'm I'm doing the things. I'm I'm uh, not sleeping, but that's normal. Excellent. Uh, what are you drinking? I am drinking um <laughs> a Hack the Planet Hazy IPA. Ooh. So there's a brewery called binarybrewing.co. Oh, okay. And it's like right near where we live. Um yeah. And it's basically uh, clearly an engineer who became a dad and quit to quit their engineering job to become a brewer. I don't know. I actually don't know the owner. I know nothing about them. I'm just I'm basing all of this on guesswork off of the name off off of the name of the place, the artwork that they have, and the names of the beers because all of the beers are dad jokes. All right. So there's Hack the Planet, oh, Casey IPA. There's Virtual Redality, which is the red ale. Um, there's oh god, I can't, uh, there's a motherboard milk stout, right? There's like it, it just keeps going, right? There's, there's all this and they stuff. They don't have food. They have mega bites. They have mega bites. Yep, exactly. The food, the food is 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 solid, right? It's not like I go there for the food. You go there for the beer. Um, the food is a welcome bit of you know finger food kind of stuff. Uh, their burger is passable if you want a burger. Um, but yeah, no, it's a great place to go. Um, the wife and I really enjoy it. Right on. Yeah, Modelo isn't that special. <laughs> it's, it's delicious, though. That's right. It's the beer of America now. Yeah, Nothing right. says America like Modelo. <laughs> exactly. Listen, cheers. 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 We're professionals. Yep. All right, John, let's start the news. Let's do it. All right. So what do we got going on in the news town? Well, um... If you haven't yet, play some reinforcements and write in about it. Let me know what you think and get entered to win some prizes from Shiv Games. That's the that's the way it works, right? Um, I I play have opinions win about prizes. it. Yeah, play reinforcements win prizes. That's that's it. Uh, but do let me know what you think. If you love it, if you hate it, most importantly, why? Right, that would be really interesting to know. But that's basically the deal. Then for painting this quarter, so very up until the end of the year, right up until the end of the year, 2023, once it's over, it's, the painting contest is over, uh, paint up some S4 remotes, right? So this could be Evos, this could be attack remotes, like Bulleteers, um, Rushis, uh, any like Vostoks, anything out of the Nomad, you know, Nomad land. Um, if you don't have an S4 remote, paint up anything S4, right? So you can paint up like an Alpha. If you play O12, you don't want to paint up a... a if you already painted up an S4 or something, or if you don't have an S4 remote at all, you can paint up an S3. It's fine. So everybody should have access to some flavor of that, so you can actually purchase more tractor it. moles. Yeah, more tractor moles. You can also like if you play tech, you need four of them. So paint some more. It's true. You need four. You need four. It's true. I've actually fielded four several times. All year again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Correct. <laughs> that that is how that's how you do it. Um, let's see what else we got going on. We've got. Um, uh, you want to talk about RC Go? Yeah. So um, nothing too big, but actually it is kind of big. It's a big stepping point. So RCGO, a road city game organization, which is the nonprofit that uh, I started, we just dropped off a big box of donated board games and magic cards uh, and other stuff that we've received from our community uh, at. The Serendipity Center. What is, so what Seren is this? Yeah, we were, we were about to say. Yeah. <clears throat> so Serendipity Center is a, um, I don't know, like, I don't know if it's private or public is the right way to describe it because it's, you have to apply to get in. Okay. But they take the kids um, from the school district that are, that need kind of the most one-on-one -on -one attention. 
Oh. Uh, kind of the most difficult kids in the school. You have to, I think there's like seven signs of trauma and you have to check off five of them. I see. So there's a bunch uh, of prerequisites to get in. Yeah, a bunch so, of prerequisites to get in, but the school district. It's like a school, a school interview that you want to fail. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, or if you pass, it's. Yeah, it's also bad. Yeah. Um, but no, it's a fantastic center and we were able to drop off a bunch of, like I said, a bunch of probably 15 or so board games, uh, a bunch of pre-built decks for magic, some bulk magic, uh, the three core books for D&D, some player packets that I made up for them. Um, yeah, so we're pretty excited to have been able to at least, uh, you know, help out our very first uh, real community in the city. Well, congratulations. That's really cool. Yeah. It's, Thank you. Uh, I, I just watched A Bug's Life again. Uh, because kids and it's just like you you planted a rock and it grew into a tree oh there we go yes exactly exactly that's that's how it works right it's it's it's, it's yep. an ant thing you, you wouldn't get it <laughs> um all right in other news speaking of things that are growing we have uh the asheron's fall not a kickstarter but a game found project all right, so you can yep. find that here in the chat. So I'll put that in the Twitch chat. It's also going to be in the YouTube description and the, um, the podcast description as well. It's not live yet, it seems, but you can, you know, find out more info about it. John, what click it? that follow button. If you follow, I think you get five uh, pounds or euros or whatever, whatever European money, I guess it's euros, um, that it's in, you get a five uh, euro discount. Yeah, there you go. So you can click the follow button and, and get spaceships when they're available. If you want to know more, we've actually had uh, Randy on to give us a sort of a quick demo and we'll talk through some of the mechanics of the game. And that's on uh, previous episodes. You can go find that on our YouTube page and learn all about it. I would recommend probably watching that one as opposed to listening to that one because uh, sure. he, he does, you know, do the top down uh, camera thing and show us all the cool widgets and ships and stuff that he's got access to. So that's really rad. Yeah. Definitely go check that out. Um, speaking of other things that are coming soon, uh, DreamPod 9, we hear we hear tell that the Heavy Gear RPG is landing soon. Um, so, yes. so get hyped about that. If you want to roll some D6s. In- imminently. Imminently, yeah. Like like supposedly any day now. So yeah. so I would be uh, I would be keeping an eye on your your Facebooks, your Reddits, you know, the usual the usual socials. So the kids say these days. The the socials. Socials. That's not what the kids say. Is oh, it what well. the kids say? Yes, it's gotta be what the kids say. We we know. We know. Yeah. <laughs> They're gonna start now. They're gonna, They're gonna yeah, we're trendsetters, trendsetters. Late night war game colon trendsetters. There you go. <laughs> uh not not even a little bit. Right. Um but yeah, go check that out. Uh, it's happening soon and you get to enjoy it and play some silhouette. Right on. Well, I think that's all the news, which means it's time to talk about our toys. All right, let's It's copy it. time! So, let me pull it up really quickly. Boom! Yeah. What do we got going on here, Adam? Yeah, so I picked up the uh, the Northern Light Tanks for Heavy Gear Blitz and built them, and they look rad. They so, look great. Yeah, they look very... I mean, so they they look very much like the old one. Um. They actually, the uh, the designer went back to the original concept art mm-hmm. uh, and built them off of that. So they feel a little bit more sci-fi-y, which I appreciate. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a sci-fi setting, right? Um, and yeah, so went back to the original concept art, was able to integrate some more uh, of the original ideas that were into there, like the cool dome turret for the, uh, for the, was it Thunder Hammer? The, or oh, the Storm Hammer. Uh, the Mortar? Oh, I think Storm Hammer. Yep, the one in the back with the big mortar. Mm-hmm. Um, so that looks really good. Overall, the 3D print quality of these is really nice. So are, um, are these resin print- casts or are these 3D prints? They're 3D prints. Oh, okay. I was gonna say these are these are very good for resin. Yeah, There's a lot so of no, undercuts they, and stuff. So. Um originally I think they were working with Tiefling Workshop or some other 3D print provider. Mm-hmm. And they have since moved uh got in-house 3D printers. I think they're all printed on like 8K. Um, okay. 3D printers. Well, they've and dialed it in. It's pretty crisp. They dialed it in really well. So it's the guy who does all their resin. And like, I feel like DreamPod 9's bigger resin kits are usually pretty. Yeah, they're pretty, pretty solid too. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, so they just came out super sharp. The other really cool thing is 
the designs are already drilled for magnets. Oh, well, that's so nice of them. Right, because like drilling into three D is a or three D print is no, you usually don't do that. Yeah, back. they're so brittle. The resin. Uh, and the way it's done, it's done in a way where you don't need the magnets. So if you're not somebody who likes to magnetize, it's like it's like the uh, the the peg that goes into the into the socket for the cupola, then has another hole inside of it like a donut. Oh, I see, I see, I see. There's an inner radius. Yeah, exactly. Um, Got it. So Very just cool. super easily, I was able to put in some four by two millimeter magnets. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, so pretty chunky. Of, yeah, so then that's also really nice, right? So they really hold on mm-hmm. well. Um, so you can, you yes. can uh, without fear, push them around while making tank noises. Uh, 100%. Uh, that's in, entirely the plan. I also picked up um, an extra set of the turrets. Uh-huh. Uh, so they sell them separately? The packs, well, yeah, so each of the packs comes with like the, the battle tank clam. So either the, the, what is it, the standard clam there in the middle, the right. bandit hunter on the right, or the new snake eater on the left. And that's what the rail guard and then, is. Yep. And then it comes with one artillery turret. So then he has a pack of three additional artillery turrets. So one of each of the other one. So gotcha, I, gotcha. I can make two of any variant. Yeah, the new Snake Eater claim, claim on the left there is pretty brutal. Uh, yeah. Light railgun and light anti-tank missile. Mm. So weaker anti-tank missile down from the mediums on the uh, the stock claim, but the light railgun is brutal. Interesting. I wonder why they. Huh. I mean, it's an old, it's an old unit they brought back. No, I know, but I mean, like, it's just kind of interesting. The, the the design language is that two, two missiles is a light one, and three missiles is a medium. Oh, kinda. they're they're actually smaller diameter, like very slightly smaller diameter too. I see. Probably hard to see in the picture. Yeah, it's hard to see the picture, and then the the medium ones have the like the doors mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or whatever it is on the flap, the little diagonal line that makes it look sci-fi. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, and then the uh, the Snake Eater also has a light rotary cannon as its secondary weapon mm-hmm. instead of the heavy machine gun, so it's a bit bigger than the uh, than the other guns. But overall, details really crisp. Like the gun barrels and that little tiny light rotary cannon are great. You can even see the uh, the gun barrel on the rail gun right above it. Mm-hmm. It all came out super sharp. I was um, pessimistic. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Moving into 3D prints, uh, but I have to say, like this, the quality of this surprised me. Yeah, it's really good. Can't wait to see them painted up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I'm you paint the you've, you've painted your South tanks up really nicely. I think they'll look great. Okay, it's, I'm looking forward to it too. I'm, I'm next time we play, there's gonna be a lot of tanks at the table. Oh, good, great. I'll have to uh, <laughs> bring some railguns of my own or something. Yeah, please don't get me in melee. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just bring a, a lot of uh, Eden uh, golems and call it good. There we go. Uh, well, oh, cool. what have you been working on? I've been working on uh, this. <laughs> <laughs> the the shot to... <laughs> Well, so so uh, whoever set up the Shattergrounds forum in uh, in um... oh right right right. Yeah, it's a hundred percent spelled wrong. So, had to make sure to Perfect. call that out. <laughs> Perfect. And this was the so what, uh, the time that so I figured I out how to do at? YouTubing. What's up? So, what am I looking at? What are you doing? So, I f- I figured out how to do VTubing. Um, oh no. Yeah. So that's that's the thing that happened. Quit your day job. Yeah. Right. I I can I don't I don't need to make money anymore. I can be a VTuber, VTuber for, for full time now. I just need to have a voice changer. And then I'll be a, a, a cat girl on the internet playing video Dream games for people. Dream come true, John. Dream come Dream true. Dream, Dream come true. true. This is what I've always wanted. This is this is what my parents raised me to be. <laughs> <But> yeah, <laughs> you can you can go check that out if you're interested. Uh, it's basically just like uh, Aaron and, uh, and Melanie prepared a big. Um, I guess it, uh, Aaron wrote a lot of copy and then recorded herself um, doing the whole the whole thing. So that's that's her voice, not mine. Uh, although I am, I am the combined in the, in the, uh, in the video, but yeah, it's, it was, a, it was actually really interesting. I think one of the, one of the most fun parts about, um, about these campaigns is, uh, I have to learn a lot of new software packages very quickly. Um, <laughs> because and, of the random things that you end up doing for it. Yeah. I mean, you're always like this, this campaign was the campaign that I learned how to use illustrator. 
Um, oh, sure. I mean, like learned, right? Like I can, yeah. I can cut and paste things real good now. Um, so you're coming for my job now? Yeah, I'm gunning, I'm gunning for you, Adam. Move aside. It doesn't pay as well, so. Yeah, right. Um, so there's there's that. I also like I'm am uh, getting back into After Effects and sort of like learning that too. Just just enough to be dangerous, right? Like sure. not, not actually be productive in them, but uh, like I've I've used enough terrible engineering software that it feels very similar, uh, and and so Perfect. it just it just makes sense, right? You're yeah. like, oh, this is asinine. Why is select V, right? But you're like, yes. okay, that's normal <laughs> for me. Like, oh, you want me to hit a very complicated set of key commands just to save a file, like escape colon WQ exclamation point is what you want me to do to save? Okay. Yeah. We'll do it. I feel I feel like they're all very intuitive. You don't yeah, it's fine. use uh V to select things and K to subselect and Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a command option shift S if you want to save it for the web. It's it's so intuitive. Yeah, that's that's just the way it works. <laughs> but yeah, that's you what I've been up more, to. <laughs> so like in Photoshop, I just from working past jobs, I've got really quick at knocking out backgrounds mm -hmm. behind people. And like <laughs> Lauren always asked me to like, how do I knock out the background again really quick? And I was like, oh, it's really easy. Command all command, you know, command A, command C, command V, command I, uh, command shift U, command I. <laughs> and she's like, wait, what are you even saying? <laughs> right? I was like, oh, you duplicate the layer, you invert the colors, you play, you know, you um, basically bleach it all out to white, you use that as a mask, you create the mask on a new layer, you paste that into the mask. It's just like, stop it, you just do it. Interesting. I use I use the, the magic select tool. That's pretty no, good. magic select tool is for amateurs. It's pretty good. What do you what do you do about hair? Right? Hair's got all these wispy little little individual hairs that you want to for, keep in over the background. Specifically for uh for like actual life pictures, it's hard, I agree. But for anime, it's easy. Oh, for anime, it's totally fine. Yeah, magic yeah. wand, like who cares? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like I'm doing things that have like, uh, like uh, semi translucent basically semi translucent edges. Yeah, yeah, you're doing you're doing the old Lucas Arts or sorry Lucas Film, cut out the, yeah. the Tie Fighter technique. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah, no, welcome to the world. Next, you'll get a Wacom pen, right? I actually have one. Oh, there you go. Bust it's it not, out. It's not a. It's not. It's a Chinese knockoff. Okay. Uh, and it's a screen. So I can actually look Ooh, at it. Like, it's a, like a Cintiq. Yeah, yeah. I have a knockoff I, Cintiq. It's real I can't bad. Use it's real bad. <laughs> I've I've tried using them, and and it's probably just because I've been doing it for twenty years, not looking where I'm where I'm drawing. Yeah. That like it's actually like too distracting. Like I can't. I need to see under my my fat meat wad. I can't. Blocking. I can't. I can't use the Wacom at all. I tried, and I'm just like. <laughs> that's so that's basically how I feel. Like I remember as a kid, like seeing like grandma try to use a mouse, yeah, and like you know she can't figure it out. And now I basically feel like that because I've used a Wacom for twenty years. I haven't. I own a mouse. No, you don't. <laughs> I do. You gave me one. Oh, that's right. Is that is that the one you're using? <laughs> no, I I don't know where. It is. <laughs> you went and got a mouse. Oh my yeah, gosh. I I own a mouse, but like. I don't know how to use it. It's weird. It's like drawing with my feet. Holy cow, it has been over two years. Yeah, I was um, just looking at that. Whew. All right, well, uh, so I think that wraps up our, our hobby stuff on a little bit of a tangent. Let's talk about our games. Let's do it. I like to do games. That's what I like to do. So you, you finished a campaign. I what? You finished a campaign. I finished a campaign. Oh, yes. Sorry. So, yeah, I finished um, I finished our first No Thank You Evil campaign uh, with my kids. And they didn't know it, but they were just playing through Seven Samurai plus a couple side quests. Um, makes it really easy for me to know the story. Uh, but, yeah, so we uh, <laughs> it was it was really freaking cute, man. Um, so I sat them down to like start preparing for the final battle, right? Like the the bad guys finally going to show up and come and raid the village, and 
you know, they got to talk about how they're going to arm the villagers, how they're going to prepare the village, how they're going to train the villagers to defend themselves. And then uh, I ended up putting them up against a pair of ghosts. And mm. they figure out that the ghosts are afraid, afraid of their own reflection. So R- Ruben, who was playing, uh, uh, his character's name was Didu Dadu, the robot. Nice, nice. Uh, which is how he says R2-D2. Um, Didu Dadu, the robot, figured out that he was shiny, so they polished him up uh, to scare the ghosts away. Oh. Then, right? And then they figured out, or no, then, uh, you know, I kind of did the, you know, the, um, you know, and then the quiet, right? What's happening? Did they do it? Did they succeed? And they they kind of thought that they that they saved the day, but then you know then the real boss came, mm. uh, and the real boss's weakness. I didn't mean to do this. It was just the card I drew out of the deck because I was like, oh, this guy looks rad. Boom! You have to fight against the hex knight or whatever it was called. Um, and like his weakness is teamwork. So <laughs> so uh, Ruben and Jean had to work together to defeat this guy. And then I got to the quiet, ominous voice again. And they were like, oh, no, it's something else coming. It's something bigger and neater coming. And then I just, you know, described the sun rising and the day has been saved and all this stuff. And Ruben, uh, like Ruben's face got flushed and he started like tearing up and then just started clapping. (laughs) (laughs) And roll credits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And roll credits. It was it was pretty fantastic. Um, so yeah, had a lot of fun uh <laughs> playing that campaign. We'll probably play more Think of Evil, more No Think of Evil. Um although next I want to check out Magical Magical Kitties Save the Day. Okay. And so No Think of Evil is it's it's solid. I feel like it's a little bit token heavy. Um No Thank You Evil is. Yeah, No Thank You Evil is. So you have like four or five base stats and you're burning tokens on each of each of your stat has a different token and you're burning those tokens to reduce the modifier or to reduce the dice roll right mm. so it's like you need a, a four to hit you burn a token i need a three to hit kind of thing right gotcha. um, and so it's like it becomes a lot of tokens to keep track of and then you have tokens that you use to replenish your tokens and uh hell of magical kitty save the day actually is a bit more of a, a much more streamlined system um, you just have three stats, and the three stats tell you how many dice you roll, and as long as you get at least one, four, or greater, it's a success. Got it. Right, and your stats are like, it's stats are great. It's like cute, was it cute, cunning, and claws, right? Because you're, you're, yes. you're, yeah, you're playing kitties. There's a, there's a bunch of ones like that. There's another one that's very similar. I forget what the stats are, but they're like drive raccoon or something like that and then like the premise is you're a bunch of raccoons who are oh, going to like a fast making and an airship, right hmm? you're making an airship they're uh they're i mean they that might be one of them there's another one where they're like uh going to a fast and the furious like you know tokyo drift nighttime street racer thing and they have to like race a car right but like as like it's it's a bunch of like people in cars right Oh, okay. Right. And then like, so imagine like Vin Diesel rolls up and then a bunch of raccoons, like, you know, like in Ratatouille, hog tie him, throw him, throw him to the side of the road and then drive his car. Right. Like that's the, that's like one, it's a one shot RPG thing like that. So, I see. I see. Yeah. So like you have to like make all these rolls and stuff for that. So lots of really weird, weird things like that. A lot of, there's a lot of really fun, like one page, uh, one page RPGs and stuff that I think would be fun to explore with kids. Yeah. The thing I liked about um, about the scale of Magical Kitties, though, specifically like the the story packs they've already built and everything, yeah, it's it's that you're a cat, right? Okay. Like, so you're not really expected. You're not going to be able to take down a human, sure, in combat, right? And the scale of the the scale of the problem of the like challenges in the game are like uh, literally dealing with alien invasion. Sure. Like right. Mars attacks. And, level yeah like mars attacks and you're just a cat and right. so how as a cat are you solving this problem and so it it de-emphasizes combat mm-hmm. which i like that was my only complaint about, about or my only other complaint really about um no thank you no thank you evil is that it's about battling the forces of evil 
So it's it, most of the engine is based around combat. And of course, you could push it wherever you want. But, you know, when, when most of the rules are about combat, combat is kind of where the rules lead. Um, so kind of want to try out Magical Kitties is something a little bit just a little bit different. But yeah, so it was a lot of fun. Finished up that campaign. They've already started asking when the next one starts. Um, That's cute. So <laughs> probably soon. Um, and then, yeah, and then uh, I played a game of Infinity with you. We did. We did. I, I, we finally were able to coordinate the calendars and show up in the I same know, place. I know. I know. So uh, you played your Drews. I, I am playing Nomads for the, for the Shattergrounds campaign, which is what we're here to talk about. So we can talk about this game real quick. Um, but yeah, we played yeah. Drews. Thank you again to the guys for setting up uh, this table for us because we were both late because we were doing dad stuff. Um, but yeah, we can talk about our, our list. You want to go over your list first? I can, I can, yeah, read, it. So I can I, read it off uh, for right. people, or unless you want to. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah no, okay. so I'll go ahead. So group one, um, Arslan Lieutenant, Drews HMG, Drews Hacker, uh, and Two Diggers. So that's a, a five-man core. And then um, a Harris of uh, Brawler, uh, multi-spectral visor, a brawler hacker, or MSV sniper, brawler hacker, brawler engineer. Uh, parked next to the brawlers was a clipper and Denma Conley. So I could always regroup up to five if I needed to. Oh, or that's just... a full five? You can do that? That's cool. I mean, it's yeah, true. Everything... It's not surprised, but I, I just... Everything in that first Intrigued. combat group is completely interchangeable. Mm-hmm. Um, and outside of the clipper and Denma... All of it gives the uh, full bonus. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Oh. So it was pretty. It was pretty fun to start with those groups because then I started with all you know all the bonuses and then mm-hmm. I could mix in and for the burst bonus at the very least as needed. Yeah. Um, and then group two was uh, a pair of Fugazi, the budget trip hammer, which is the heavy shotgun flam and spear Benzerfaust, um, and a uh, pair of Yan Yan. Very cool. All right, my list is a little weird. Um, it's uh, <laughs> Kusanagi. It really? It's yeah, right. Kusanagi Lieutenant with the multi rifle, uh, Lemieux the MSV one version, an Evader Engineer with AP Spitfire, Zon Nautica Hacker, uh, Jazz and Billy, Mary Problems, a uh, Samsa which is the new extra mercenary comes with a plasma rifle. And super jump, uh, a Gator, the non NCO version, because I couldn't afford the NCO version, and a Liberto. So that's a full seven swick and 300 points. It was, uh, you, you had a, a dense, beefy list. Yeah. I really just wanted to make Mary work. I mean, this is my third game with this list. Um, I The rest of it makes sense to me. Mary is kind of just like a, I don't know. I, mm. I played her in N3 several times. She did. She did fine, um, but I. I just don't. I want to keep using her and finding like her, like where she slots into my play style. And so I think this game was the first time that I actually got something like useful out of. Right. Yeah, she was decent. I my list was. Uh, I haven't played Drews in a while. Sure. And let's see what they have. And like Drews is a totally different army now. Yeah. Like they're they're such a different army. They've added so many tools to them, and that's not a complaint. That's just like lots of really neat stuff. Um, yeah. and it's it's it used to be to the point where it's like you're just taking things to, to finish up your points but now it's like they have so many things I don't know what I I feel spoiled for choice um, yeah that's the problem that I have when I build Drew's list I'm always like what do I do what do I put in here I want all the things right and there's so many units where I feel like like not taking um, oh my god uh, Fiddler mm-hmm. like I feel like that's a choice but I also feel like there's plenty of Great stuff in there. There's plenty of other stuff in there, yeah. Saito, for example, great choice. As yeah, well. Sa- Saito is all he was in and out of my list a couple times. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. And Definitely. yeah, when they, I think when they added the Yan Yan to the list, that's actually when I feel like it really, yeah, came it together. Really, yep. Denma is a nice addition as well. Denma's fine. Like he he worked out really well for me just because we had that the I do not like how tall those. Um, pillars are mm-hmm. uh and he just happened to roll climbing plus in a clutch position yep uh to counter uh samson otherwise i would have been not happy dealing with him all game yeah uh, pretty much but he's he's fine you know he's not dirt cheap he's 12 points that's pretty cheap 
I mean, it. I don't know. I don't know. What I, you it, get? I think it's. He's I think it's more man. Yeah. Right. Like he's still at the end of the day, he doesn't do much more than a warband does. Other well, than... I mean, he's a more reliable warband, right? Because he has he has plus one burst on both of his guns, which gives him plus one burst in CC, right? Yeah. And we we know the. I mean, obviously, it's not the beast hunter because the beast hunter has camo, but we know that's good, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not like a first turn assassination piece like the beast hunter is because you can't really get there without camo, maybe or maybe not as efficiently. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think he's good. Right, and Alex and Obi are making yeah. great, great points, which is that he's cheaper than a Dadarazi and a Makul. Well, I play Ariadna, and to me, war bands are six points. Five know. points. Five <laughs> points. Five points. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but, I mean, like he's he's fine. Yeah, I don't I don't think he's game breaking or anything. I think it's a fun yeah. addition, for sure. I mean, he doesn't doesn't have any extra survivability. I think that's my main issue with him. Sure. Yeah, that right. I can understand. Right. Um. Oh well. Yeah. So quick, quick stretch of the game. Um, you deployed your, um, you, you deployed first. You deployed your brawler Harris on this building on the left, sort of covering that one fire lane and also like most of the right side of the table in case I like mm-hmm. pushed past the mid the mid line, which I think is a really good, good call. Fugazi, you're just out to do Fugazi things, and then you put your Druze HMG on like a Mesa plateau thing with the rest of the link sort of parked behind it, the trip hammer like behind the big shadow of the corridor system and the big rock on the left. Um, yep. I basically null deployed with the exception of Lemieux who was out to fight things, um, specifically your Druze. And I made sure to put a saturation zone in the way. So we can take a look at my deployment over here. Uh, I basically yeah. just spread stuff out. Um, my plan was to have Billy on the right in case I needed to white noise that brawler. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was my game for the game plan for that. And then my, oh, we should probably mention that this is a resilience operations game that we played. So let's talk about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I rolled appropriation, interrupt the signal, and silence. So appropriate this, uh, appropriation is grab a beacon, interrupt the signal, destroy a beacon, which made it very hard. My other option, mm-hmm. I think, was um, the weird frontline one where it's like secured the two strips in the middle. I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. Um, Adam's sure. going to be too aggressive. It's going to be a link in the middle. It's inefficient for me. So like, I'm not going to bother. And then silence, which is uh, basically go kill two HVTs. Uh, instead of yeah. shooting, use whip rolls, but basically the same idea. Um, yours was King of the Hill, which is a eight inch circle at the middle of the table. Um, you also had silence. You had triangulate the signal, which is every, if you haven't read through all the stuff or like looked at resilience operations, everybody carries uh, a deployable called a, a beeper, right? Yep. Like it's the 1980s. I think they carry one, right? They carry one. It's like the 1980s yeah. or something, but they have to, they have to, you have to poop it out, right? That's basically it. And then I believe it's like, if it's on my side of the table or if it's in my deployment zone, you get more points or something like that it has to be there at the end of the yeah, game. Yeah, it's one point, for one point for each one of the table up to two and then an additional one if one of those is in your deployment right. zone. Yeah, exactly. So you kind of want to push out the table and like deploy them late in the game or defend them and it's kind of hard to defend them. Kind of like um, flags in heavy gear. So it's, like, it's, so it's, actually, a, it's a timing thing, I think. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if you necessarily want to deploy them late. Oh, that's a, yeah, specialist kit too. Um, because if you have the ability to continue deploying them through the game, like deploying them in positions to force your opponent to respond, like suddenly there's an objective here. If you don't do anything about it, I get a point. Sure. Right. So like how many orders can I bait you into wasting to, to go blow up one point of mine that I can just go drop with somebody else? That's fair. The fact that you have basically as many of them as you brought models, more or less, is a difference yeah. from flags. Flags is definitely more of a timing game because you get two and that's it. Yeah. Flags um, from heavier lists. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, no, that's a good point. I like that, but it, I think I think it's still a timing thing. I think it's you're 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 absolutely right, and that's a good way to sort of control the tempo or 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 put a forcing function on the tempo and be like, hey, I, this is here. You're gonna do anything yep. about it. Um, and so that's that's really cool. Uh, and oh, also, it's gonna yeah. be depend on your opponent. Different people will respond differently to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was what was your take on me? Just out of curiosity for doing that. Um. Uh, so the, there were a couple of points where I, where I forgot that I had them and w- wished I had dropped them. Um, but you did find digging them out. You had the right tools for it. Um, mm-hmm. Between the evader being able to hop over uh, yeah. the terrain, hunt down the one on that side of the table. Um, while Sansa was up, it was pretty hard to hide anything from him. Mm-hmm. Just because that just because that one pillar is so damn tall. It's so damn tall. Uh, yeah, it's more of a 40K. 
That's what I, I made it. I made it for them for 40k. So mm-hmm. I made it like taller than an Imperial Knight. Yeah. Then... <laughs> oh well. Yeah. Um, but no, I thought you did. I thought you did fine. You didn't... I don't think you let me have any. You, you... I think I only ended with one, right? You ended with one because I had, didn't have enough orders to take out the yeah. last one. And that's what it was. Like you said, it becomes something where it's interesting because um, a lot of objectives are about how many orders you spend to score the objectives. Right. And they put up tools for me to make you spend orders, right? Yeah. So, so you did a good job not wasting too many orders on them. Mm-hmm. I, I tried to make it like really efficient because like I needed yeah. to get my gator forward and throwing the gator forward while also double chain rifling a beeper was pretty no brainer. Yeah. I felt very safe because they're like, arm one bts zero one structure mm-hmm. so landing two damage 14 like guaranteed hits seemed pretty reasonable yeah um, but yeah like this is a good example right so i was able to kill denma but i wasn't able to take out the beeper here yeah that's right i passed i i failed the dodge i think and then you failed the dodge because i because 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 you were targeted so i was on 20s <laughs> yeah is, that's right which is such a silly a silly thing to say on a liberto um but and then I had to go to the right of this picture, and I couldn't go. To, I couldn't like swing around that gray wall to get the get at the beeper. Um, so oh well, I didn't. I didn't have the orders to finish it out. But yeah, well played there for sure. Um, one thing that I really think is interesting is uh, the beacons are destroyable in, at range because it's just anything with antimaterial. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's actually it's actually sort of set the. Uh, set my prioritization there because I was like, oh, well, I'll just shoot the one that the gator can see with explosive rounds. And then um, I set up the Zonautic on the other side because I want to get that beeper, I mean, the the beacon back to my deployment zone. And the Zonautica is obviously the right choice for that because um, it's so damn fast. So, yeah, I don't know. I think some really interesting things came out of this game that uh, we didn't really, uh, we don't really do very often. So let me find the picture to sort of better illustrate it. Um, I'm talking about all the smoke stuff. Oh, um, sure. Okay, so so this is actually really smart, right? So you you start off. Um, this is where it starts. Yeah. Okay. So so basically, what happened was um, you started things off by landing smoke in front of Lemieux. Lemieux can obviously see through this, right? Yeah. And so what you did was you popped the Drew's HMG up in full view of Lemieux and started moving the other dudes around, and you were like, "Do you do anything?" And we did the math, and I would be on tens, and yeah. you would be on nines, and you'd be four yeah. on nines through the saturation zone, and I'd be one on tens, and that just like seemed terrible. So I was like, yeah. "No, thank you. You may you may move around to your heart's content," and that, uh, and then you like very cleverly popped the um, the the HMG back down prone at the end of that, right? So you like basically out and backed, and sort of were like, "Hey, I'm here. Are you gonna do anything about it?" Um, and then you made the Druze. Uh, hacker your leader with everybody else out of line of fire and then you shot two repeaters out uh, just to you know annoy my tag or whatever um and then um and then you were kind of in this weird position where you're like i want to keep going but if i keep going and john doesn't shoot the drew's hmg he'll just shoot a digger for free and that will suck right? yeah so you so you i'd force the dodge and the diggers are reasonable at dodging but that still sucks so yeah. what you did instead which i thought was really clever um, you you short skill move the Druze HMG uh, into view as the leader, and then move the Druze hacker right up to the line right before I could see, where before Armand could see, and yeah. then you were like AROs, and I said no, no thank you, um, and then you just like okay, I do my second short skill move, and then you basically got uh, more than a cautious move because you get a cautious move to that, no problem. Yeah. Right. I but you I was got, able to move, move. You got you got a double move out of it, um, just by sort of playing the arrow arrow game there. So I think that was really really clever clever move there by you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So that was that was really neat. Uh, and then and then there was the big the big moment where you were out of cover, and I'm like, okay, now I'm on the 13s. So um, these are the odds, right? My mine's uh, I'm at 29.4 percent. You're at 39.2 percent. And so I, I obviously didn't know these odds exactly when I was when I was at the table with you, uh, right, but it felt it felt okay. There's spooky odds. There's yeah, because, there's spooky odds, right? Like what was that? you're on thirteens, and I can't remember what I was on. I think you're I was on nines. nines. Yeah, you're on nines. Yeah, so it's like there's a there's you know you land within a nine and a thirteen, and I can't hit you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Unless you yeah unless you uh, unless you crit. So yeah. 
yeah, those are those are some spooky odds for sure. Um, but you know, you 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 got you got a shot through, took away Lemieux's ODD, so I dropped him prone, and that was, and I just sort of used him as an order for the rest of the game. But he did he did his job, right? That's like a good four or five orders of just yeah, like you really twiddling you back and forth. A lot less efficient on that first turn. Yeah. I could have used those orders in that first turn for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then, you know, the rest of it was just Mary landing, uh, sorry, Jazz landing a repeater, and then, like, just bullying the shit out of your poor diggers. Ah, that and, was like, so annoying. Yeah, and then just uh, just oblivioning, oblivioning them and all that. Uh, and then the Samsa spending, like, four orders to kill a brawler in the open with the 16. It's just like, what? what is happening right now? Right? Like, these odds are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, those are the odds, right? You dodge, there's a 16.9% chance of you surviving. And for four <laughs> orders, you're just like, whatever, don't care. Seven, 17% of the time, it works every time, John. Yeah. It's just like, okay. And then and then the last order, I land all three hits, and I think a crit or something. And yeah, you're like, yeah. well, we'll see if he survives this. Nope. <laughs> One bajillion saves. Yeah, right. So I was like, all I have to do is land one plasma hit, and then you like pass both saves on the plasma hit in one of these orders, and I'm like, come on, number two BTS three man. Like... Yeah, no, it's real. They're real good. <laughs> it's true. So yeah, that was that was fun. Um, that was a great game. I also played uh, two more two more games of this. Uh, list. Oh, wait, let's talk about the final score really quick. Oh yeah, sure, let's do it. So you won the game. I did. Um, what was the final score? It was 8-4, like 242 8-4. to 106. So you, <laughs> this is entirely because of that last photo. Yes. You didn't know I had um, king of the, the, the one to claim the, uh, the king of the hill. Mm-hmm. And when I went out and measured it, you were like an eighth of an inch inside of that middle eight inch zone. <laughs> So if it wasn't for that, and the only reason why you stopped advancing there is because I kept like getting lucky and not dying and wasting your orders. Yeah. And then so you decided to go use the liberto instead. And it's yeah, like had, yeah. you, had 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 I died like right. I should have. Yeah, like uh, literally this is what happened, right? So uh, to the left of this clipper down speech bubble is a uh, fugazi. So I killed the clipper and I and I I made one shot on the fugazi and like it didn't die and I'm like well. I'm out of orders now. The only other thing that I can do this is Liberto. And you're like, no, move, move the gator. Yeah, keep going. Don't stop your, you're on a roll, man. Yeah. Too funny. Um, yeah. But was... I mean, so that, that kept the game from being, it would have been like a seven, seven tie. I think so. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, crazy, like well, some crazy high scoring tie. Right. Uh, I mean, but... it, it, it's interesting because uh, we noticed that same phenomenon happening when you when we played like heavy gear book missions where we have non in, like non mutually exclusive, um, yeah, points available, um, and so that that can happen, right? Like we could have both scored all of our points, which is basically almost what happened, right? If you had gotten King of the Hill, so yep. there's that. Um, I played another one uh, game with with this list versus Frank's uh, the shot. Um, Let's look at his list. Yeah. So group one, he's got a, um, I don't know, Harris of a Zhuyong HMG Lieutenant, a digger for cheapness, and Valeria because she's awesome. A duo of Maggie and the Rafik. Fiddler with two jackbots, uh, accompanied by a Nazmat for extra efficiency. A Coom with light shotgun at one of the Deshot Liberto mine layers. Group two is Double Fanis, Evo, um, a Shahab, uh, which is the TR bot, another Coom. Um, so not a whole lot to talk about this game. Um, I think basically the 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 real issue for Frank was I also over infiltrated the Samso on this game versus him and like sniped out the Rafik real early, which is a big deal. We're playing Last Launch, which is actually a really fun mission. Um, basically, if you haven't played it, you haven't read it, the general idea is there's three consoles down the center line. Uh, one of them is in an objective room. The other two, like, make ID tokens. And basically, the idea is you're basically getting a ticket to ride the space elevator, and the objective room is the space elevator. So the idea is you get a specialist to one of the outer consoles, you beep boop it, get an ID token, and then you can go into the center with an ID token and escape through the space elevator. Or somebody can take that token from you and go escape via the space elevator, and then you you get more points for more specialists killed, more specialists escaped, um, more points escaped, and then like I think one or two other things, maybe like a classified or something. Um, but anyway, 
that's basically the gist of it. What's really interesting though is the Evo apparently doesn't require an ID token to escape. It can just like roll up and do the thing on its own, and baggage counts. So okay. that was so I I did, was not expecting this, right? So I felt pretty good about the first turn. Frank went first, like the Samso just annoyed the shit out of him, wasted a bunch of his orders, much like it, uh, much like the uh, Lemieux did against you, um, and then. Uh, right in in Frank's second turn, he just like rolls, he rolls the Camille up and then just like escapes with it, just gone. And that talk about efficient, um, yeah, because that's thirty five points and a specialist, like oh. escaped, right? Um, and so that's sure. that's six points. If I if I don't escape anything, that's a six zero win for Frank if he does nothing else. Jeez, right? That's crazy. Yeah, um, that's and huge. So if you think about it this way, right? My my only real option was the evader, and the two consoles were one was like in a really awkward spot on the right with a bunch of stuff looking at it. I didn't really want to go over there, and then the other one was on a roof, which I felt pretty okay about. And the evader is climbing plus, so I was like, super good. Just gonna hop up there and do the thing. Yeah, Aleph is gross too because she can get uh, still can get Eva, right? So then I was like, the evader is a great option for this because I can just climb up and like ignore the ladder and all that stuff and climb up where I want to climb up because I've got climbing plus. Um, but even if I did that, the evader is only thirty four points. Right, so this one yeah. stupid fifteen point Evo bot just outpoints you, and you can take two of them. For sure, you, you no, Evo bots are, are gold for that, huh? Right, so I, I just want I just want to also call attention to like how genius of this construction is by Frank. So look at this, right? So there's a bunch of like if you look at this, you're like, all right, after that, um, it, it, like if if you if you look at group two specifically, what is that group going to be doing? It's got two Fennis, a Camille, the Shahab, and the Coom, right? What is that all about? So. If you're smart, you take from that group um, on the first turn, I think, right? Arguable, right? The first, the first group, you could, if you take two from that, that's a lot of things I want orders, and you're really putting pressure on it because it's already a six, it's already a six order list um, because of all the um, all the stuff in there, right? All the irregular stuff in there. So it's kind of like, eh, I don't know. Um, I think that's what I ended up doing. The group two is really smart because you just burn all those orders on the coom, just like suiciding into something. Great value on the first turn, right? Coom's doing stuff. It'll get something, right? Because it's dogged and all that. Turn mm -hmm. two, you just dump the Camille in. And you have plenty of orders to do that. You can you can you can you know take the long way around if you have to, because you've got extra orders to do it. And then on turn three, you've got three orders on a TR bot. Yeah. That's great. That's a, good, that's a solid plan. Right? That's a really solid plan. I like that list a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought about the Evo, but I mean, Evos are cheap enough now, 15 points. Like, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really think about it either until he did it. And I was like, oh my God, did that just happened. <laughs> Evo's OP. Yeah. Right. And I was like, what, what, what just happened? Why, why did, why, why? Um, but anyway, that's too funny. Give me one second to take care of this thing. Boop, boop, boop. But yeah, so and then I played one more game, and I'm gonna hit some buttons here really quickly. By the way, your last Welcome game. Welcome to that Pete. Wild Pete appeared. Hello. How's it going? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, I have sound. And you um, do. I'm I'm still awake, so it's going fairly well. Here, here. The folks out there on the internet can hear you. Uh, the bar is moving on my screen, so hopefully that's that's the case. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, it's usually a good sign though. Yes, and then my my last game um, was versus Jordan and his steel. I'm playing the same list, so his list is um, Hector with the plasma rifle, uh, Machion and Myrmidon uh, using the cheap Myrmidon in a, in a in a core, Phoenix and then double Myrmidon in another core, and then Hoplite Scylla and her her friend Bot in a in a Harris, and then in a game of missile. Um, I got incredibly lucky. And Armand ace the Agima after two orders, nice. which is exactly what you want to have happen, <laughs> right? Uh, and that was that was him in the active turn too. So it was like one die and one die. He, we happened to be at like forty two inches, and I was like, excellent. <laughs> that worked out very Ooh. well. Um, and then he absolutely murdered the Samsa with um, just like throwing the 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 um, Dave a bot at it, which I think was the right choice. Then it was just the the Gator doing Gator things. So the Gator has been been quite good to me over these last few games, but yeah, that's sort of that's sort of the long and the short of it. Right, well, welcome, Pete. Uh, thank you for making it. 
Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking tea and trying very hard to stay awake at the moment, which is... Uh, it kind of comes and goes during these campaigns, but I end up staying up way too late, either trying to finish reports or, you know, figure out T-shirts, patch designs or various things. So, yep. um, yeah, it's tricky. Well, I appreciate the effort. Indeed. Well, cheers, Pete. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm coming into this kind of cold. How are you? Uh, how are you talking through the campaign, and, and what are you? What's well, the structure? We are we are now at the. Uh, we, we just finished the uh, the game section. Unless you want to talk about some games, uh, campaign games that you've played. Um, I can actually pull up your your battle reports if you'd like. If there's something you want to share in particular. Oh, um, well, the the last game I played that's buzzing in my head was a game I played at Gamescape last night against Matthew, the famous Sir Wall. Um, oh yeah, of Panoceania, and it just went completely crazy. I think the quantum anomaly thing properly kicked in. So I'm still trying to write the report now. I shouldn't spoil all of it, but I'm going to a bit because uh, it's in my head. So yeah, we we played through a 250 point game of power pack. I was trying to play to the mission, get out there, and I booped two of the buttons early on, and had a, a dakini set up on a roof, kind of stopping things happening, and a. Um, Sujan firing rockets across the uh, Panzerfaust back across the saturation zone at him. And his plan, as far as I can tell, was for a suicidal charge with a Knight of Justice that he wanted to basically turn into a cartoon episode in his report. <laughs> but the weird thing that happened when he tried to do that is it got plot armor. It just oh, no. became unkillable. Oh, and no. it failed at suicidal charge. Yeah, it well it became uh, the it, main character. It completely did. Yeah, it made I want to say like twenty or twenty five armor saves. Whoa! I uh, in the second turn, it had kind of got to midfield. Um, it got flash pulsed when it ran out towards me because it was running onto a war core and a sujan at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it got pinned in front of the sujan and stunned. Then managed to make a dodge out of the second Panzerfaust's path, ran with a um, uh, ran with a Knight of Santiago to try and hit the middle button, mm -hmm. but the Knight of Santiago ran onto a Quang Shi that wounded it with a pistol and then chain rifled it when it came forwards and tried to get to the button. Um, so that was a pretty good trade for a Quang Shi, five points yeah. versus Santiago Hacker. Um, then he had a. a Equestrian Knight of the Sepulchre, you know, the big hollow echo guys with the multi HMG mm -hmm. storming mm -hmm. down the middle as well. So that got in behind the Knight of Justice in the middle. And I brought my Sujan out in my turn to, to um, attack those guys. And I managed to kill, you know, kill the unconscious Santiago and knock out the, uh, the Equestrian Knight. But during that, the Knight of Justice made two dodges into uh, base to base with the Sujian. Oh boy. And I had a bunch of other stuff pointing at it. So in his turn, he started CCing it and I just shot everything in there. Like a deal was shooting breaker rifles. Um, there was a, a celestial guard shooting combi rifles. Uh, two Quangshi were just kind of sitting on the sidelines waiting for him to come out of combat. Mm -hmm. um, one of them in a link, another one on its own. Um, and uh, he kind of let slip that he has pre had Predator as a classified, so he just wanted to score Predator here. He was like, fine, I'll CC the Sujian. It's going to be right. funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I shot so much stuff in there. He must have passed like three or four saves in that engagement, and then Adil shot the Sujian out from under him as he was trying to kill it. Um, Fear so victory. <laughs> yeah, so he ran forwards tanked another two or three saves from the, the guys shooting into him. Uh, in, in the campaign mission, there's plus one to BTS for, um, well, basically everything. But for Knights of Justice, that puts them at BTS 10. 
So even with uh, Adil's breaker rifle, he had, uh, what, five off the damage on that? Right. Um, and the flash pulses as well. My little flash pulse bot got super lucky to flash pulse him earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, it didn't manage to do it again. Oh, dear. Um, so he then ran on to three Quangxi chain rifles and ran up and murdered one of the Quangxi in combat. And as he did that, he took a round of like three multi-rifle armor-piercing um, shots from my CN, which was set up to try and protect the console and himself. Um, and he somehow tanked three chain rifle saves and I think two of the multi-rifle shots. Maybe one of them went through and left him with one wound. Mm -hmm. But then he managed to get forwards, kill another Quang Shi in combat. So that was two out of my link. Right, and that's Predator. He, that's Predator. He survived the uh, the second salvo of like BS fourteen armor piercing rounds. He was just in the open marching through these guys. <laughs> then he attacked the Sien, oh and I think I decided to CC him back, probably because I was tired more than anything else, rather than shoot him with more uh, suppressive fire. But he put one round, one more wound on the Sien. And that was the end of his turn too. And we discussed, you know, should we call the game here? It's getting pretty late. Mm -hmm. And I decided, no, I've got this. This is, this is going to be fine. We should just play the game out at this point. And at that point, I had a solid win. You know, I had um, uh, I had the two consoles and I had a classified, uh, like secured the HVT and it would have been fine. But I figured I could just pull a deal back into a combat. Yeah, and a deal's a monster. A Knight of Justice and it will be an even better report. So I did that. Uh, a deal swings, lands a monofilament hit, and he makes a save. And then, um, then we swung again, and he crit a deal to death. And oh, then, gosh. yeah, there wasn't much more I could do really. Uh, so <laughs> he, I positioned a couple of things, but he killed the Sien in combat. He killed a Quangxi that was on the console in combat. He came around and killed the Celestial Guard that was still kicking around. And then he was having such a great time. Uh, and he, during the course of this, you know, he tanked a couple more chain rifle saves. And, of course, uh, of course, like you do. Yeah. And, and won the combat versus the Celestial, which isn't that much of a stretch. Then came around and shot the ninja because he really wanted to kill everything. And then... The, uh, the final sting in the tail of the game was he got so kill crazy with this knight that he hadn't got enough orders to get back onto the console, so he could have won it if he'd gone for it. <laughs> but instead, he he went to kill everything, and I had three points left at the end of the game. He had like way more than he should have had at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, hey, as long as as long as uh, you know, you, you kept the win, right? Yeah, I scored points for the faction. Um, but it's going to be a hell of a report to write up now. Yep, I'm gonna yep. Know that post. <laughs> write, write it up from the sickbed, I guess, right? CN, CN is just dictating to, to, to Yaza, holding a recording. Yeah, this, I'm, what, four games in? Games in. This will be his second reincarnation so far. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're not cheap either. So I hear. Oh, well, he's holding things together, kind of. There you go. Well, very cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's cool. kind of a rough campaign from the Yujing point of view. We're having trouble with uh, outbreaks of ninjas. Yep. And uh, Wo okay. Yep. Well, all right. Should we, where? should we get on to the uh, Shiv Game sponsorship? Yeah, say so before I start going into my only observation of the campaign so far. Um, so uh, it is that time. Every week, Shiv Games provides one of our lucky listeners with a random prize. This week, it's a little bit less random, kind of on point. I think Jeff was maybe a bit distracted when he's, he came he's out slipping. With it. He's slipping. That's what yeah, it is. right. Uh, but tonight, we're giving away a free blister pack. Uh, or for the, the game we're talking about, Infinity. For, for yeah, for the game we're talking about, for Infinity. All you have to do for your chance to win is enter in the secret word that Pete prepared before the show. Cough, cough. What, me? Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, yes. desalination. <laughs> desalination, there we go. All right, so go ahead and type desalination into the chat. Uh, and Pete, why is that funny? <laughs> uh, because of the bonus mission for phase one of the campaign. Um, 
which uh, John wrote, and uh, we have a logo and everything kicking around for it. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> I just love, sorry. <laughs> that was completely inarticulate, but there we go. <laughs> I, I, I feel a little bit bad for just like throwing you under the bus and putting you on the spot, but I also don't actually feel bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a long running gag, I guess. Um, so the uh, historically, Yu Jing was seen as the saltiest faction in the game and always complaining in the forums. Uprising was probably the cause of that. Um, He's because, a big contributor for sure. Yeah, certainly it fed it, and and uh, the it, it was even intended by uh, Corvus Belly to uh, create rivers of salty tears from Eugene players when they lost their Japanese troops and they went to their own sectorial. So um, yeah, after a couple of campaigns of trying to. Uh, fight against the Japanese in all of these campaigns. The the Yujing leadership decided to try and pivot very aggressively away from fighting the Japanese and just getting on and, and doing our own fun objectives in every uh, campaign. Um, sure. So uh, in Dagama, notably, we took on Panoceania and thumped them repeatedly. Um, in... Uh, yeah, Shattergrounds, not going quite so well, but uh, that's because we're fighting at the JSA again by accident. Um, Is so, it by accident? I mean, like, I. Well, I no, feel like Corvus like... Belly forcing us to do it, but I probably should have gone off in a another direction and forced us to, you know, try and steal the yacht club or something. I mean, my I feel like my experience from trying to run the or help organize the NA2 side of things is that you cannot mobilize. Any two players against anything other than J than uh, Yujing, like specifically JSA players against anything other than Yujing, doesn't happen. So <laughs> I'm not surprised that like oh they're they're incentivized to fight Yujing this time. Like guess what they're gonna do? A hundred percent. All right. Well, let's see who who won a blister right. to help help win the yeah, fight. Hit that button. Hey, congratulations! Scott 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 Scott. Congratulations. Uh, and I'll go ahead and get your information over to Jeff at Shiv Games. Uh, a little bit of a long aside, but. There we are. And of course, thank you everyone for listening and thank you Shiv Games for your support. Okay, now this yeah. button. Without further delay, it's time for the main event. Yeah, so if you're interested, I put the link in the uh, in the chat. It's um, basically uh, I, I stole the, <laughs> the template and uh, Pete helped me out with some art. Um, but yeah, this is just a, this is just a reskin of my uh, radiation leak mission that I wrote a while ago. Um, but it's pretty fun. I, I enjoyed it. And then we pee through together this lovely patch as well. And I'm using the wrong font. <laughs> yeah, we have a running argument about which font should be on that patch. Yes, but, yes. Uh, I'm but hoping Adam will back me up. But he's not going to see both of them or care. So that's going to be... The, the Lemutra head one? No, uh, this... this no, uh... the oh. desalination patch there's, well, there's don't go running off making a patch i'll make you a better one there we go <laughs> okay fair <laughs> enough but yeah so the the campaign let's start off with the uh the the basic premise right so uh it's an area control campaign run by corvus belly and on tabletop which is um you know it's this it's, it's a sort of um system agnostic campaign engine i guess it's built on the wordpress um you know content management system uh and basically what it looks like is we're fighting over uh various territories on concilium prima uh we're in phase two now but there are six territories each with some a bunch of fluff you can go read if you're interested um but there are more factions than there are locations so i think as you put it pete it's a game of musical chairs um and so let's take a look at say etta right here you can sort of see what that looks like so effectively, the way this works is when you play, you write a battle report and um, you put your opponent and uh, your faction, your opponent's faction, and then basically who won. You could include uh, text describing what happened. And of course, um, let's take a look at this, this Nomad report that came in. Right? So there's a bunch of, bunch of text here. They've included some pictures. You can rate and comment on it if you'd like. Um, but the key point is 
uh, here, right, that combined army won, right? So that's that's an important yeah. thing to, to see here. And what that does is it contributes um, three points to their total, right? So if you lose, you get zero points. If you win, you get three points. If it's, it's a tie, I think both factions get one point. And then it's a it's a basically winner takes all. So uh, it doesn't matter how close the fight is, right? So Pano is currently 57 versus the 48 of the combined army, right? So if combined army was at 56, it wouldn't matter. Pano is still counting as winning the theater, right? So um, that's the way that goes. Uh, we have had some problems in the past with um, report spamming. There's still some problems with that now. Um, and so one of the things that you do need to be aware of, this is sort of a more PSA section of the, uh, is um, you do need to enter your reports on a timely basis because you can't enter more than three in a 24 hour period. So you can't just like bank 10 reports and then stealth dump them on a theater at the last minute, right? So, which is good. Which is great. That's a good thing. Uh, oh, yeah. Also, yeah. But uh, you know, just just remember that. One a day would be fine as well. <laughs> yeah, one a day would be fine, and uh, is probably a little better for your sanity anyway. If you're if you're actually uh, spending a fair amount of time on it, which I think a lot of the people are. That's one of the nice things about the campaign. Um, I think one of the one of the wonderful things about it is uh, a it is a big global campaign. Right, so it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can play, you can get involved. There are people writing uh, writing uh, battle reports in different languages other than English, right? Um, so there's a, there's room for everybody to participate and really get into the fun. Um, it, you end up talking to people that you only really talk to during campaigns, uh, which is also really great. Uh, these are people that you know I would consider good friends now because we've been uh, yeah. part of the campaign together for years, every, every year with the exception of the brief hiccup during COVID. Um, yeah, no, it's been, it's been a lot of fun getting to get back in touch with these folks. Um, just getting to know them between campaigns a little bit better, exchanging hilarious memes with them, uh, sparring verbally and in, uh, in role play forums and kind of, that kind of thing. That's, that's sort of the, the sort of the thing. One of the, one of the, um, the, the issues with this though is that um, given given the amount of work that's involved in setting up the, the sort of infrastructure for all of this, um, it can be difficult to sort of respond in a not just timely but impactful way to their narratives that people are creating. Because there's a lot of really awesome story arcs that are happening. If you look at a particular player writing up their games, there will often be a uh, a through line story. In fact, some people actually have like they compile their whole series of battle reports over a campaign into like one long comic book issue. Basically, um, looking mm -hmm. at you, Danger Rose, you're awesome. Um, yeah, seriously. But really? yeah, go check out uh, go check out the Sand Cats and the Wrecking Bells. Um, but yeah, so so uh, it's hard for for um, on tabletop and CB to sort of work that into the the campaign fluff. This year, Killian has been doing a great job of uh, of, of, of responding to memes and, and forum trash talk. Um, but it's hard to sort of bake that into the actual, you know, nuts and bolts of the campaign itself. So that's sort of an overview. I don't know if you, either of you think I, uh, miss anything. You want to add anything? I think you touched on it well. Yeah, but that's most of it. I mean, the, there's private forums in there for players. I guess that's, the social aspect tends to solidify around individual factions. So they'll have a private forum and most of them have a private discord now as well. So people are chatting between each other uh, in their own private discords. There's some cross pollination and spying going on between those. So that can be kind of funny trying to figure out what moves other factions are making at different times. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sure. Yeah. It's interesting, right? Because like this is one of those situations where you can't, you know, actually verify everybody that's in these forums and stuff. And you have to sort of like, not everybody's going to be in the discord. You're not going to know everybody. There'll be some like random guy, you know, in a completely different uh, time zone than you, you never met them before, but they are like listening to what you're asking them to do as faction leadership. Um, and, you know, you have to tell them what the faction is doing to sort of everybody's coordinated working towards the same goal. And so you have to broadcast your move in the open. Uh, which is which is a which is you know a, a fun and good thing, but also a kind of an interesting bit of uh, you know espionage or counter espionage stuff that's happening. 
some some factions have been quite successful about having sort of inner circles of generals, and I'm thinking the Swords of the Prophet for Hack Islam yep. at the moment, mm-hmm. who, who tend to be a group of players who can actually put out quite a lot of battle reports, and they can have a secret objective and go off and start dumping reports in, in a theatre um, without anyone knowing and start making a move. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think if we were going to talk about this, I think I think Hawk Islam is probably the most coordinated and the the most tightly knit faction out of all of them, right? They consistently do this year after year. I would say they have the best. I mean, I think the I don't think Urheil really plays all that much. I haven't really seen him contribute much in terms of games over the years, but he always always writes up amazing like fanfic in the in the forums, right? He's like he just he has a whole thread going of like completely unrelated to to you know like games happening he's just like yep this is like i've i bought into the fluff this is what's happening uh i'm running a search and rescue mission of a uh a, a, um isolated fishing trawler off the coast of montalban right like that's that's mm-hmm. the story that he's going with and uh it's just really fun to watch watch him do that and then other people from other factions are like oh i've got a, i've got a, a boat you know nearby you can land the refugees on my boat and we'll take care of them, and so they go. They bounce it back and forth, and they do, sort of develop this little like vignette of a story that happens. We should probably talk about the story a little bit. Yeah. So um, what what is the 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 gist? Why why is the why is the battle happening? Where is it? Okay. okay. Well, it's all kicked off following the events of End Song, which okay. are you know the the biggest shift in um, Infinity law and fluff for a long time and and what's happened there is that there it's kind of complicated (laughs) but (laughs) events came to a head the combined army has been attacking the human sphere for a while to try and get a uh, a doohickey called the checky digester yeah probably saying it wrong but that's what we call it for now um and the, the Toha and the secret faction of the Triumvirate within the Toha have been uh, trying to hide it or obfuscate it and protect it from falling into the hands of the combined army. That came to a head on Concilium um, when some uh, the humans and, and Pan Oceania, I think, and the O12 had come into custody of the Czechy Digester and moved it to a location called the Penny Arcade. Okay. It seems like a huge combined army um, fleet had moved in and was basically taking over Concilium. And the, which is the capital of the human sphere. Which is, yeah, yeah the, the capital of O12, which is the governing body of the human sphere and the capital of the human sphere. And the Spiral Core, who are the, the Toha Triumvirate's secret mercenary wing, somehow managed to negotiate a contract to protect the Penny Arcade and then were about to steal it and realized that they couldn't protect it from the combined army and detonated a doomsday device. And that device has created some kind of quantum doomsday annihilation thing that is ripping the entire planet apart. But a dog in a kilt was able to interrupt the process part way through. And this is McMurrah, mm-hmm. placed dog there dog. by destiny somehow. And he he slashed the, uh, the doomsday device in half with his Templar sword. Mm-hmm. And Total immunity is bullshit, isn't it? It does seem to be, yeah. <laughs> That should break um, physics. <laughs> yeah, so the, there's a lot going on. But the the biggest thing then that fell out of this is the combined army realized that they wanted to get access to the Czechy digester that was exploding, but slowly. And they wanted to slow it down even more, but they realized if they got into a fight with all, all of the human forces on the planet, they wouldn't be able to do that. So they have finally... Uh, asked for a treaty, or their way out of this was to ask for a treaty with the humans. So Mm. they are supplying technology to slow down the explosion of the Czechy digester and slow down Concilium and stop it just going full uh, Alderaan and blowing up. And uh, 
So the O12 has signed a treaty with them. We're at peace with the combined army for the first time since Infinity has started. And, Interesting. Uh, and now the bad guys, as far as humanity is concerned, are really the Spiral Core because everyone's <laughs> pretty pissed. The they bomb. tried to blow up the capital planet of yep. uh, the human sphere. It was uh, for a good reason. And that huge set of Ensong background is kind of where the campaign picks up. So there's this new fragile piece, but the boundaries are not very well set. Yeah, Obi, Obi uh, wants to make the point that it's an armistice, which is not quite peace. No, it's not quite peace. So, um, yeah, the, the combined army are trying to ship technology down into each, each one of six quantum anomaly zones. These are the, the zones that are both critical infrastructure to the planet and we can see them on the map. They look like the big domes there. there. There's also some kind of quantum just annihilation event going on there that's really making things get kind of wacky. Strange creatures are popping up. The ground is cracking open under people's feet. And the combined army is trying to deliver technology down there that can slow this down. Uh, and they also want to steal bits of the checky digester they can get their hand on or probes that it's sent out to these different areas. Um, but the humans are also trying to jockey for control of areas on the planet and to make sure that the combined army is not in a position to just wipe out the entire planet afterwards. So even while this armistice is going on, there's uh, boundary disputes, people trying to take ground and take control of facilities they shouldn't be in, and uh, quite a lot of fighting going on. And yep. uh, you can be a part of it today with On Tabletop and the Shattergrounds campaign. <laughs> but you're probably already a part of it if you're interested. So. Yeah, right. yeah. If, you're here. if you're here watching this, you're probably doing the thing already. <laughs> right. And you had to listen to me just dredge through it really slowly and awkwardly. So I apologize for that. No, I think you did a great job. I think, I think uh, you know, I, I certainly wasn't aware of uh, a lot of the lore behind a lot of this before I really started digging into it before, you know, and during show prep, I actually went to War Lore, the channel, which is a cool channel. Go check that out. Um, he goes through a lot of the, the background as well and talks about all the different sites, uh, why they're meaningful and so on. But... Yeah, I mean it's been it's been a great opportunity to just reconnect with all the players that we enjoy hanging out with in discords and and uh, you know uh, enjoying this game with. It's one of the nice things that you're just like, yeah, everybody that is here is doing so because they really enjoy this game. Um, maybe they express it in different ways, but the shared love of the game is there, um, and it's been a blast so far. So one of your uh, <laughs> you mentioned. Um... Pete, you wanted to start talking about some of your games, other uh, than the uh, the most recent one. Yeah, I've played uh, three games so far that I managed to get reported in here. Uh, and my tactic for these is normally to try and come up with a, a narrative that that uh, guides Yu Jing a little bit into attacking the thing I want it to attack. Since I've been involved in the Yu Jing High Command for what three campaigns now. Oh yeah, we should probably mention that uh, that there are sort of unofficial, like uh, uh, faction leadership positions that happen. Uh, yeah. Factions sort of handle this in in very different ways. Hak Islam has full blown elections, um, so if you want to like engage with diplomatic relationships on day one with Hak Islam, they're like, wait, 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 we're holding elections, right? And then eventually, like, and then all of a sudden, like a bunch of people leave Discord groups, enter Discord groups, and like, okay, we are now the duly elected Hak Islam High Command. We may now negotiate on behalf of Hak Islam. Before that, we weren't allowed to do anything, kind of stuff. Ariadna do something similar. They say yep. they're holding elections, but at least two groups hold elections and disagree about the results. And then about two weeks later, you find out which ones are actually right. the player base is listening to. Yeah, that tracks. Feels about uh, right. Yep. Yeah. I've I've been part of the Nomad leadership for quite a few campaigns now. Uh, I keep offering to to. To, to work with other people. Uh, last year, Aaron and Melanie stepped up in a big way. This year, uh, Fua Fua uh, is, uh, is doing a great job. Um, and he's uh, he's definitely doing a lot of more of the coordination stuff as I, I do a lot of the more back-end 
sort of organizational and meme meme craftery. Uh, <laughs> Which is really what you're here for. That is, yeah. I mean, honestly, I'll you know to be to be frank, uh, we've we've done we've done episodes on previous campaigns before. Uh, there can, I mean, it's it's a system uh, where there is a clear, quantifiable way to win it, uh, and so people will game the system to to do that. Um, and for those people, it may be enjoyable for the people that they're doing it to, much less so, which is kind of crappy. Um, sure. And you know, I definitely got engaged with a lot of assault before and getting upset about it. I uh, also had some bad experiences sort of doing other gamified parts of the war console. Um, and so I've decided to just sort of take a step back from a lot of the gamified parts of it. It just say like, it just engage with the parts that I actually enjoy, which is chatting with people about the game, enjoying their company, uh, making good memes, um, and then, you know, writing quality reports and sort of helping other people weave together a collaborative shared narrative across multiple factions and across multiple, uh, you know, mediums, whether it be the forums and Discord, um, you know, trying to trying to um, lobby Killian to include something in, in his daily updates. Also, great job, man, like doing, doing very regular updates. Uh, you're killing it. Um, you're killing him? I did not intend that, but... There you go, for free, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so so I I've, I've intentionally sort of just said like you know we're here for the memes, um, and if we get some good battle reports and get our get the nomad symbol on the map, great. If not, that's also cool. Oh, very cool. So what's the? Uh, I think we're on the second phase now, right? Mm -hmm. What is so? What has happened in the first phase? Who who, who are the big winners? Who are the big losers? Who can we dunk on and make fun of? Anna, Anna? And who can we <laughs> congratulate for their success? <laughs> well, let's see. Let me pull up. I'm gonna. I'm pulling up a uh, picture of the first phase. Unfortunately, well, I don't have the uh, the the actual logos on the the faction logos on it yet. But so, um, Oklanir is held by the Ariadnans and the Ariadnan Workers Union, right? So it's basically a. Uh, it was a like that? a seafood processing hub. I guess, um, and so Pano, being the capitalist, uh, you know, hyperpower that it is, was sort of uh, taking advantage of the workers there, and they took over. Um, Bai is the Hakislamite uh, terraforming environmental stuff. Like there's a, there's a campus there for for terraforming things. Hawk just sort of parked on it, and nobody bothered them because they're Hawk, and you can't. Yeah, they they started a little bit slow, so I was I was worried that the combined army might take it from them, but then they really picked up steam and and ran away with it. Yep. Uh, yeah, the the big surprise I think from phase one has been that the combined army is back with a vengeance, and it's being organized right. by a new leader. There's a, a guy out there called I think Four yep. or Noctifer yes. Number Nine in some reports is his his handle in the game. Um, oh, is it? Okay. I thought he's I thought... not the number nine, aka four. So it's it's confusing. He's definitely four on Discord, and I think he's number nine in the reports. Yeah, he's actually a Washingtonian, so he's a uh, you know, oh, really? north of me. Yeah. So I I played him. Um, he's he's a nice guy. I don't I don't want to dox him because I don't know if he's comfortable with that. So I don't I don't want to use his real name. But he's he's really he's a lovely gentleman. Um, I've been to a few tournaments that he's helped organize, and uh, yeah, really nice, really nice fellow. Uh, good player, very um, careful, considered. Uh, plays a lot with some of the better people in the in the U.S. via TTS. Um, so and his his play shows that. So yeah, so yeah, he said he also has been involved with 40k narrative events before. So oh, okay. he's he put, um, a lot of energy into the narrative and decision making for combined army and managed to play them pretty effectively. And they stole a very early lead on Edda. Mm -hmm. And just completely trounced the O12 players there to yeah. to the point it, they kind of gave up and were scrabbling around for a plan. Uh oh, yeah. So I mean, uh, one other one other interesting thing is one of Hak Islam's uh, uh, normal heavy hitters uh, over the past couple of campaigns actually went to uh, combined this year. So that's mm -hmm. been that's been a big loss mm -hmm. for Hak Islam and a big gain for for combined. So sure. you know, glad glad you guys are enjoying it. Um, but uh, it has definitely changed changed the uh, 
change the power dynamic a little bit. And that goes to show you, right? There's, there's a couple of regulars that show up for these campaigns. Uh, people come and people go, but there's definitely a core group of regulars per per faction. And if you, you switch factions or you sit out one year because of, you know, life, your your absence is felt. So, um, you know, don't don't feel like you can't contribute, right? So every game does matter. Um, and if you get two games in, you're already making a big difference. So Sure. Yeah, three games or more, you're a star. Yeah, uh, There are a few players who manage to rack up, you know, 14 plus games and they really uh, make a huge impact where they pop up. And uh, you're talking about the poor man, one of the, the hack players, he's one of those. Yep. Um, crashing on then to uh, Yujing's location in Huachiao, it is, at least in phase one, it turned out to not be Yujing's location. We tried to get a, a good start there. Uh, and we made a lot of progress, and we lost a fairly close battle by about mm -hmm. six or seven points to uh, JSA. Mm -hmm. um, JSA have got a good leader this time around. There's a guy called Kaminul who was uh, active in Dagama as the Shogun of Dagama. Um, uh, and I've been chatting quite a bit with him. He's a, he's a good guy. They seem to be, for the most part, playing fair. There's some really good uh, reports in there. Um, nice. So, some very good players, and they're having a great time. Yeah. So we need to beat them this phase, obviously, but we'll beat them fair and square or have a very close fight of it by the looks of things. Yeah, it's uh, also worth noting that JSA is sort of the the grab bag of all NA2 factions, um, Yeah, which is kind of, um, I don't want to say unpopular, but controversial choice by, by oh. the organizers. But... They are the true villains of this campaign. <laughs> I mean, sure, because that is that is the the uh, we know quantum containment army coalition's are just official here to help. Yeah, combined army are just here to help and deliver technology. But the Spiral Core, they're the true bad guys. Yes, and they're part of NA two. Right, and JSA are part of NA two. So really, the yeah, it's it's just they're the true bad guys. I'm sorry, guys, but that's how it is. Yeah. <laughs> The true um, bad guys. Yeah. So, so, so the other thing. Fighting you as best we can. Yeah. The uh, the the O twelve troops on Eda basic Eda is also the capital, right? And so not only is Concilium Prima the capital of the sphere, Eda is the capital of Concilium Prima and therefore the whole sphere. Um, and uh, yeah, so the combine basically trounced it. O twelve was like, well, I, if we if you can't if you can't beat them, join them, and so they signed a more formal agreement, and now they're working together officially. Uh, in in the player generated story, um, so there's that. Uh, Lorena is sort of, I guess, like the Beverly Hills of Concilium Prima, right? Or like the Gangnam, like the really posh, um, you know, like suburb. And so, uh, Aleph, of course, is there, right? And so that's their that's their deal. Um, CB tried to encourage nomads to go fight there. Uh, we were uninterested because uh, we could go to Montalban, where our pilots were being held, and the me and the and the meme fishing was was really good. <laughs> uh, so that's that's 100 percent why we went there. I mean, they wanted to, they wanted us to go there anyway, but we were like, oh yes, we're we're 100 percent going there. And the memes have just been been super fun to make. Um, so you know we've got we've got our free willy memes, right? <laughs> um, you know, we've got the Save the Whale remix. We've got, uh, you know, this is a remix of, you know, because it looks like it looks like a SeaWorld tank, right? Sure. So immediately I, I went like whales. There you go. And then uh, the other thing is, um, if you actually go to the the next phase, um, let's see, Shatter. It's a it's a yacht club. Oh, sure. And so whales, yachts, right? Orca memes, here we come. <laughs> so that's that's sort of been the uh just just going down that rabbit hole. Yeah, right. I mean like it, they set us up for it. You got a sea world tank with orcas in it, and then you've got a yacht club and you know, yachts and yachts and whales. What do you want? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so. who's not gonna want the yacht club? Makes sense. Exactly. So that's been that's been the uh the the story so far. I guess. So yeah, so O12 is losing to combined. Yu Jing is losing to JSA. Yeah, Yu Jing was wiped from the map in this game of mu musical chairs in, in phase one. But but hang on, go back to the map. There was someone <laughs> else missing. 
<laughs> oh yes, it's true. Isn't there supposedly a biggest faction in these campaigns? There is. It's true. Big, big and blue. One might say. Yeah, I, I, I thought they had two. They did. They, they started... were so big that they got given two locations to defend. It's true because they they score so many points. But yeah. somehow they man- managed to fumble a Colnir, and the Ari- Ariadans took that from them. And yep. then uh, the Nomads freed all of the pilots in Montalban, and and there wasn't any space for Panoceania there. So, um, yeah, with a fraction of their power, Eugene has achieved the same thing as the hyperpower. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and pretty much the same as Tohar as well. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, oh, so to credits where credits do, they gave us a really good run on Montalban. They, they, uh, we were within within a game or two, so uh, it was definitely hard fought. So, so definitely kudos to uh, to the Pano commanders who were who were fighting us over the the dolphins and the orcas. Yeah, they've got some new leadership this year as well. I think so. Yeah. Um, definitely seem to be motivated by corporate profit and and such. Yes, yeah. definitely motivated. But I, I did appreciate the uh, the Baywatch memes. So there is a bit of that going on as well. So definitely, yeah. it's just refreshing to see a non a non like hyper religious military orders meme and just like like it's 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 so Montalban is also a, a a resort town, right? It's like the Cancun of this area or the the uh, Maldives or something, whatever, whatever your favorite, you know, beach tropical paradises. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, they, they of course have the, uh, what was it? Um, the Neo Canberran, uh, <laughs> like lifeguards with like six packs running on the beach. That was a, that was excellent. I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So, so the current state of affairs is, uh, you know, most folks are just sort of parked on when they're parked. Um, Pano has has decided to um, basically drive the aliens out of Eta. That's been their uh, that's been their tagline, I guess. And everybody else is sort of content to sit on their sit on their locations. Uh, and then, of course, JSA and Yujing are are having it out over the Experimental Energy Research Center at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right on. And then, so now we're so we're we're on the second phase. Is it a three phase or two phase campaign? It's a two you know? phase campaign. Okay. That's and any any exciting upsets so far? It was back and forth a bit on Montalban. They had they had taken it for a little bit, um, but we managed to push them off. I believe earlier today. So this this is definitely one of those things where like you know you just hit refresh a bunch on your lunch break and see what happens. Sure. Um, and and then and then uh, you know there's a lot of cheering in the faction Discord when somebody's like, I'm almost done with this battle report. I'm gonna upload it, and you know by 3 p.m. you know Eastern time today. I, I just gotta get through this one last thing for work, and then I'll hit I'll hit you know upload. And then you, you do that, they get three points, and boom, you're over the threshold, and you and you flip the uh, you flip the location. That's always fun. And then there's lots of cheering gifts and stuff like that. So it's a good time. And then you refresh again, and you've lost it. Pretty pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly that thing. It was, it was often short lived. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think that's one of the one of the fun things about it, right? Like you don't you can uh, you can engage with this as much as you want or as little as you want. If you just want to play some games, report them, and sort of just like see what other people's models look like, see what other people's lists look like, talk shop, and like don't care about the mm-hmm. fluff at all. You can totally do that. If you want to get deep into the fluff and only the fluff, you can do that too. There are plenty of players that aren't really playing for many reasons, right? Lack of interest, uh, just life getting in the way. Uh, so I've had some people, you know, like a couple, a couple of uh, campaigns ago, one of the top commanders was like, "Can't play anymore. I'm my I'm moving to a different city," right? And so, sure. so they sort of uh, they sort of just disappeared, um, you know. And then and they there was like an in an in universe sort of story behind that, which was a fun, a fun little diversion as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just really nice to sort of be a part of this big uh, event that, you know, other people are excited about and engaged with uh, and just have a good time together. Right on. Anything you're, uh, I guess we don't want to give away uh, state secrets, but anything you're looking forward to or 
Well, there's the one here. aspect of the campaign that we haven't really touched on. So there's yeah. a mini game for the faction leadership. Oh. Um, so uh, most factions have a high command of two or three players, and they then, during phase one, there's normally, or, or, or even between campaigns, there's some kind of jockeying to create alliances and um, treaties of uh, in-game factions who are aligned on trying to support each other on the map and make sure things work out the way they want them to happen. Sometimes the leadership happen to have long-standing friendships that make this uh, easier and almost can be taken for granted. You know, like before the faction kicked off, uh, before the campaign kicked off this time, I was really like, John, John, are you going to be the Nomad's leader this time? It would be good to know about that. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, sometimes you're waiting for the leaders to emerge and then we see if they play nicely or if they piss each other off and if they want to uh, align and get on the same page or if they're negotiating for really stupid reasons or, or trying to push deals in stupid ways to, to get through. And there was a lot of that in phase one. Um, and what that ended up with was, so O12 flipped from trying yep. to coordinate the human sphere and trying to lead a faction, I think, of Ariadna and Panoceania and JS that they'd been, and maybe Aleph, yep. that they'd sort of been working with in Dagama. Yeah, the ICAF, the International Concilium Assistance Front. That heavily fragmented. Um, Panoceania wow. ended up in a fight with Ariadna instead of doing the sensible thing and giving them one of their two starting areas just to, as, for safekeeping so that the. Well, they're, they're not like, a charity, right? So. Stuff. No, they decided they had to have both of the, the starting zones for themselves. Right. Um, so they got in a big fight there and had a bunch of disagreements. And then it became obvious that when the combined army was surging and taking over Edda, which is the capital of Concilium and therefore mm -hmm. the entire human sphere, there was only one faction that was really big enough to go to Edda and fight yeah. the combined army on its own terms. That was Pan-Oceania. So there was a big effort between all the human sphere factions to come together, create a human sphere alliance, complain uh, vociferously that Lady Numeria and the O12 had buckled to uh, the combined army and that they weren't on our side anymore and that we would secure Edda and the rest of the, you know, try and tie up the entire map for humanity. But... Uh, that those alliance talks tried to include Pano and they fell apart in a massive, massive disagreement, kind of because Pano were asking for, I think they, they were trying to steer phase two so that they would come out of it with three theaters on the map, basically guaranteed to be theirs. They, they wouldn't cede any other territory to anyone else in the alliance, even though that there were six proposed factions in the alliance. Um, so yeah. that worked out well for them, right? Yeah. So they just ended up putting themselves on the outside of it. There is now a um, an alliance called what are we? The QCC uh, Quantum you know Containment me? Coalition or NIHAT. Yeah, which I want to call NIHAT N Y H A T, um, and uh, I think that was Obi coined that. It's clearly the best acronym we could come up with, um, and has a good logo as well. But but this is the the QCC logo that John did. So we should be polite about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's well, got we can hardly tell it's if your it's... first time using Illustrator. Yeah, <laughs> it is my first time using Illustrator. If it's bad, it's bad. It's fine. That's what I said. We can hardly tell. But you can you can get an I love I love Nihat uh, shirt if you want it. it yeah, that's with, my definition. It comes with my uh, my logo on the back. <laughs> if, you, if you really want it. <laughs> What the hell? I don't know. People seem really to like it, so I put it up for There should be an I love my hat hat. Yeah, Good right. Tip. That would be yeah. that would be the real way to do it. Goodness. Uh, yeah, so anyway, the, the making and childish breaking of alliances before they even form is is kind of funny to watch. Yep. That's hilarious. Um <laughs> Then there's the, the, the Nomad News Network. I don't know if you're getting that. 
Yeah. So the Nomad News Network, um, we did that. We did we. So this is a this is a tradition that we've sort of started in Durgama, where um, Aaron basically voices voices a character called Abigail Trinity, um, who previously was just sort of just like a uh, an immobile art you know piece and just sort of just sitting there. Uh, and then I decided to figure out how to do VTubing and animate uh, a Nomad cat girl because that's the correct that that would be what a Nomad news anchor would be, right? Some kind of some kind absolutely. of absolutely, uh, yeah, some kind of furry, right? I like um, the Nomad News Network or mm, for short. Yes, yes, exactly. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm hoping to find the energy and the time to do a phase two one uh, when that comes around. Uh, and I, uh, I need to come up with a good Nomad News Network logo and all that. So that will happen at some point, I'm sure. Um, some good yeah. ones flying around. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess I guess uh, we can really quickly plug the, the Threadless store. Um, so what this is all about, I guess we should start with um, the, the, patch, the patch initiative, right? So oh, yeah. um, if you go to bromanacademy.com, you can find... The patch competition details. Um, basically, at the end of the campaign, I'm going to send out a big Google form. You're going to put your name, your address, and then a bunch of links to your battle reports. Basically, it's just a way for um, for for faction leadership to sort of encourage people to to play games where the faction is intending to put points. Um, and so you can go here and reference like where where your faction is is trying to trying to win the faction location. Um, mm -hmm. And if you if you write up uh, good battle reports there. Which are uh, are rated highly, um, you get a patch. We'll mail it to you, basically. Um, and oh, so, cool. yeah. So one of the things that we're asking people to do. So if it's something that sounds like uh, you'd be willing to contribute your time towards is being a sort of like a shipping hub, right? Because basically what happens is, um, you know, we we or others design the patches. Uh, we'll we'll get them made. Uh, we put up the funds for them, basically, or or each faction's leadership will put up the funds for that. Uh, and then we try to offset the cost of that by selling shirts, right? Sure. And I think this time we'll offset it with a donation button as well. Yes, we'll offset it with a donation it's, button as well. This um, has got a lot out of hand, I have to admit. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a lot. There's a lot of like behind the scenes like organization that that still needs to happen, uh, but like real life and real work has gotten in the way. So sure. I'm definitely behind it a little a little bit. But there's some patch designs already, right? So we've got the Hawk patch designed by Fox Given Zero. Uh, we've got the Nomad patch uh, designed by Tristan228. And we've got, of course, the Eugene patch designed by none other than the Pete here. Um, and so the, there are a couple other ones. That there, there's a note on the, the Eugene patch there. It doesn't look very much like a Eugene patch, which may be why <laughs> Eugene is losing. But in a, a flight of fancy, <laughs> I decided I was going to put Lemieux on there uh, because I guess I'm two patch competitions in here at this point. And I didn't want to just do another um, Eugene patch. Sure. Um, so yeah, maybe that's why we we have less generals because they're all going to factions where they actually get a faction specific patch. But um, not, not, not everybody falls in your narrow Venn diagram of Motorhead and Lemieux fans. Apparently not, but you know I do, so I'm doing it for my own selfish reasons. And if that crashes my <laughs> faction into the ground, so be it. I mean, I want one. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I want one too. Um, but um, yeah, so, yeah, so the, 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 the general, sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry. There's a shirt with uh, Lemuta head on it as well, which uh, I, I, I've already ordered. I'm, I'm psyched for that one. So yeah. So Perfect. the general idea is there'll be other, there are other, I haven't gone through and updated everything. Right. So there, there are other patch designs. Uh, some of them I'm actively working on an illustrator for people who have submitted some that need some cleaning up to be, uh, you know, like patchable. Right. Because there's there's a there's a bit of a, a design arc to getting patches done properly, um, in terms of like colors and stuff, and and features and, and graphic feature size. Um, but the the idea is that um, we'll make one patch per faction, um, and all the patches that don't get voted to be the the like well all the factions will get to vote internally, right? So if there's like two nomad patches designs, I'll, I'll post a, a poll. The nomads get to vote. Whichever patch wins will be made into a patch. But both patches, or however many patches there are in terms of options, will be put up for as shirts. And so the shirts are, you know, like twenty-two, twenty-three-ish dollars US. Uh, you know, uh, 
we don't make that much on, on them. It's like five bucks a shirt or something like that. All of that mm-hmm. money goes straight back into into funding the patches, right? We're trying to be transparent about it. It's not, uh, it's it's not cheap, right? <laughs> Depending on the size, right? It's a few it, hundred dollars to make the patches and a few hundred dollars to ship everything yeah, out. Yeah, it really right? isn't. So per per faction last year, it cost about one hundred and sixty, one hundred and seventy dollars to get the patch run for that one faction. And yeah, so I started off doing this for Yujing in Asteroid Blues and put out the Durian Inspector patches. Handling one faction, I just did it and handled all the postage myself because I had, what, 30-something generals to, to mail them out to, and it wasn't a big deal. Um, but the generals do end up spread out all around the world. So it's not just your sort of $5 US postage. A lot of this is $15 and filling out a customs patch to send one to, I, I know, uh, some, the one general in Singapore who's managed to win uh, in the patch right. competition. So, so yeah, the, uh, the patch production is probably about $160 per faction. The postage, again, is probably the same again. Um, and last year, you know, I was saying, oh, we should never do four faction patches again. Somehow it's spiraled a little bit out of control. Toha aren't getting their own design because I think I'm hoping they're okay with the Lemuta head one. But um, <laughs> but we've accidentally then seemed to be creating patches for O12 and for Ariadna as well. Right. So Jeez. we've scaled down from four to five, which is not scaling down. Um, so it, it's going to be a lot of effort to get the patches out. If, if if we put a donation button on there and you're uh, part of the campaign and you, you're enjoying the patch initiatives, that will definitely help us feel like doing it another year if we don't end up like a thousand dollars in debt this year. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, last year last passes. year we operated at a loss, right? So I mean, oh yeah. So this this is not something we make money off of by any means at all. So yeah, I, I think I think uh, we yeah. made enough off it. of shirts last year to cover one faction's patch. Yeah, but but basically everyone who's trying to enter the competition, at the end of the campaign, make sure you look out for the link to the form that we're going to send out to fill that in. Uh, put your address in and put your reports into that. Um, and we will, I mean, we've fulfilled this two years in a row. We will get around to it. It's going to take a little while, uh, especially for some of the further flung postage hubs. But uh, yes, awesome. people really like it when the patches come. And it, it creates a you know, a real physical in your hand link to the events that you've been invested in in the campaign. And I think people, it's, it's really fun to do. Yep. And if you if you want to submit a patch uh, to become a shirt or to be entered into um, the competition for your faction of the factions in the Quantum Containment Coalition, um, you know, please, please get in touch with me. You can hit me up at, uh, you know, wisekensaibro at madacademy.com and I'll, I'll help coordinate with the right people um, you know, we can't support all the factions, right? It's just, it's just too much logistically. Cause basically it's like Pete and the locals in his area, like stuffing envelopes for like two days. Right. So, um, you know, there's, there's only so much we can do really, but we're more than happy to, to share links to suppliers. Um, we actually have somebody, um, in Russia who's going to produce all the, the patches and stuff for all the Russian players who, we can't mail stuff to you for unfortunate and obvious reasons. Um, so, you know, like the, thank you to everybody who's contributed in the past. Like, thank you to all of our distribution hubs from last year. Right. So that basically is like, let's say you're in the UK, right. And there's a couple of UK generals. We'll ship you all, you know, 10 UK generals patches. And then you post them around the country locally at a much lower cost. Right. So we pay, we amortize the cost shipping to you once and you do everything locally. So um, yeah, if you're willing to do that, there'll be a question in the in the big Google Doc form thing that I send out, um, and I'll, I'll send it to all the, the usual places: Facebook, Reddit. Um, I'll hit up as many discords as I can. I'll ask the 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 gen- the uh, leadership to spam them out. Um, so if you hopefully you'll see it, and I'll be on broadmanacademy.com. You should be able to access that. So mm-hmm. like, don't forget that plug. Yep. Yeah, so if you want if you want a shirt, you can get it at bromedacademy.threadless.com, which is what you're looking at now. That you can get the old patches too from last year. Um, there's some pretty pretty great ones, especially Adams. 
uh, Recruiting Lansgar. Beach one, which is, I think, my favorite one <laughs> last year. I cut the sleeves off of that one and turned it into a tank yeah, top. Yeah, 100% the correct thing to do. You gotta fix the font on the Wu Yan one. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll just post another one so you you can you can you can you can vote with your wallet. How's that? Yeah, that'll work too. Uh, there's the O12 patch in here as well. Um, yes. Which which is a strange <laughs> one. Why are we doing patches for O12 when they <laughs> clearly uh, yeah joined the enemy? <laughs> the answer is because Lady Numeria is awesome. Is the answer? Yeah, that, that is the answer. She's she's uh, she's fucking great. Yeah, she's hilarious, uh, and she also was the postal hub for France um, yes. last year as well. So, yeah. you know, between being helpful and incredibly funny, yeah, what uh, a what a lovely human. Heart hearts out to her. Yeah, and of course, uh, wonderful wonderful meme that I, that I made. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fantastic one. I I'm pretty pretty pleased about this one. The the Leonardo Leonardo DiCaprio aiding aid, uh, yeah refusing to date anybody older over twenty five, but yep. set to the infinity change to all infinity ladies. Fantastic. Well, cool. Anything else we want to talk about this campaign before we take off? I mean, the the campaign's relatively fine, right? Like I, I think that there are. You know, I think there's the the tendency to approach them from like a purely competitive standpoint and want to win. And then when you do that, I think that the flaws in the campaign system yes. become maybe uh, more relevant or exaggerated. But I mean, if the point is to have fun in the infinity setting and give yourself an excuse to you know get invested in your games, like it, it works fine. Yeah, and we've talked about it. This, this sort of phenomenon in the context of tournaments, right? So uh, I'll give a quick plug to Country Fried Minis, where he interviewed me uh, at the Rose City Raid this this last year, or this year, I guess. Um, and he was like, he was going around asking people, why do you go to tournaments like this? And obviously I was helping you run the tournament, so I wasn't like mm -hmm. attending. But my answer to that, like, why do I travel for tournaments is to, is to see people I only see at these tournaments, right? Yeah. Like people live in another state. That are like three four hours away i'm not just gonna like randomly go see them on a weekend unless i'm like in town for work or there's a family outing over there and i'll, I'll make sure to schedule you know, a lunch or a dinner with this person or their and their family um so this is like the one excuse that i get to see you know it's like it, it's it's the it's the nerdy gamers version of like going home for thanksgiving or christmas or whatever holiday you celebrate right this is like the holiday you go to celebrate with 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 chosen friends and family right you get to go share in this uh, share in this uh, experience together um, and this is this is much like um, you know Infinity Global League doing all their global tournaments. This is a way to do that in a in a narrative driven way. That's that's less competitive if you don't want it to be, um, and it's super fun to just to just enjoy in this and and write silly uh, little you know vignettes of stories together and 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 throw memes back and forth and and. Like, like, the, 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 like it's it's just it's just the the enjoyment of memeing, really, right? Because the whole thing is like you come up with this funny idea, um, and 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 then somebody remixes it or builds on it or works it into their narrative, and and it's just this, uh, it's it's such a great dopamine hit to just be like, oh, like they read the thing that I wrote and they internalized it and they worked it into their own narrative in a way that's funny and and you know they you feel seen, you feel heard. Right, and it's just it's just a it's just a great feeling. So if you if you're into that, um, and and you like to stay upbeat and 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 pleasant and uh, about about these sorts of things, I think this is a great experience for you. Yeah, I I like to see it as a collaborative art project almost. Yeah, exactly. That, that all the people, sure. or I mean, it's a game as much as it's art, but it lets you kind of flex the hobby side and the creative writing side, and even you know graphic design skills or build them from zero in some cases um <laughs> actually both of us though not not just um john this week um yeah so it, it sort of lets you expand the way you see infinity and the way you see the game and take it in other directions and uh, and try and see what you can do to to help your community in the game uh and and just have fun with it and uh yeah it's it's really good. Um, it doesn't have to be as big a narrative campaign as this to be that kind of fun either. The uh, Hungry Walrus thing earlier yeah. this year that we talked about 
had a lot of the same positive things going on. A lot, a lot of the same folks are back, and I'm seeing them in other factions pop up. So uh, hopefully there'll be other community events as well as the the big CB events, and we can learn. And uh, these will go on to be be greater as we go. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a blast. Well, right on. Uh, thanks for catching me and hopefully everyone else up with the uh, campaign. Well, you've wasted another perfectly good evening listening to Late Night War Games. John, take it away. All right. So if you want to get in touch with us, you can do so at our Discord server. You can find the link to inv in the invite link at latenightwargames.com. If you prefer email, you can do it at mailbag at latenightwargames.com. It goes straight to me and Adam. Uh, make sure to to uh, tell him tell Adam why you love him. You don't have to say anything about me, but he he needs that. So definitely include that in your Thank emails. You, um, if you if you want to play some Infinity in weird ways or learn more about all the stuff we've been talking about, you can go to bromanacademy.com. That's sort of where I put all of the uh, sort of community stuff that I do or and, and uh, sort of uplift um, everybody who wants to put in there and 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 put battle reports. If you want to publish stuff on there, let me know. We can talk about it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we're here every first and third Tuesday of the month at 8.30 p.m. Pacific. We know it's a weird time, so if you can't make it, we understand. We can barely make it ourselves. Um, and uh, we upload everything to YouTube and your favorite audio podcast app on the following day, so you can catch up with us there. If you want to support us, you can do so by becoming a late-night wargamer on Patreon or just subscribing to us on Twitch. So thank you to all of you who have already done those things. We love you. Uh, thanks for hanging out and, and uh, enjoying all the nerdy stuff together with us. And of course, a big thank you to our sponsors, DreamPod 9, Shiv Games, Corvus Belly, Board, and Brew and Brutal Cities. Pete, you want to plug anything? Play for you, Jing, in the campaign. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> Get your games in, report them before the deadline. Yep. Yeah. Play fair and, yeah, report great games. All right, well, uh, be sure to catch us on Facebook, YouTube, and anywhere that you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment to give us, give us a five-star rating on iTunes and follow us on Twitch and YouTube. All of this helps us bring you the best content that we can. All right, everybody. Stay safe out there. See you next time. Good night. Uh, 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 uh. Won't you play games with me? And I like to do everyone. That's what I like to do. That's what I like to do. That's what I really like to do. That's what I really like to do.